I want to do more of what I was able to carve out here in my infancy, in my third year at CES. The message is we belong here. I can share news about innovation, tech, food, not for black folks, but from a black point of view. I think that is something that we should see more of. I'd like to see a more diverse panel of broadcasters sharing their perspective on what they saw, what they know is coming up. I'd like to be one of those voices. That's why I like what you're doing, because one of the things I would say has been notably missing in the entire time I've been at CES, there's never been a stand up from a black media news or entertainment source. Even while people are becoming billionaires who happen to be black. The Black Futurist. That's one small step for man. <laughs> okay. Let me bring you out for one second. Years ago, probably 2008 or 9, my friends and I had just built these websites for HBCUs. And we were doing events all over the country. And then we decided that we want to do a show. And we wrote a show, it was our first time writing anything, and it was a travel show called Amazing Journeys. And we would go from city to city kind of telling some stories that were half brand related and half culture related. And at the time, Ford was working through an agency that you were working with. And it's amazing to me that it is just the first time that we met recently at CES but you were the final signature on the agency side for the person who would say, yes, this sounds like a good idea. Let's run this show with these guys. And and it was a a big victory for me because I felt like things that felt impossible could be done. Things that I'd never done before were just possible in storytelling and in getting black media sold. So I just want to say, first of all, just to start this whole thing on welcome Melvin Wilson. And thank you so much, brother, for being that voice of yes in my world, man. It was fantastic. Not a problem, dude. I, I'm just glad I could be one of those voices that said, yeah, that look like us. So, you know, that was part of my job description at the time. I was like, we were putting a lot of belief in untested ideas that came from people that didn't look like us. My job was to make sure some of us were among those few as well. Um, and I mean, I, I couldn't turn down anything that had digital outreach around, you know, place of love for me, which is HBCUs. I went to Hampton mm-hmm. University. So, I had to explain that Hampton wasn't Hampton, Sydney to most of the folks <laughs> I worked with for like 10 years. Right. You know, who were Detroit Pistons fans who were like Rick Mahorn. Like that, that was, they knew who that was. <laughs> that's ridiculous. So that's the other thing that we talked about recently. We went to CES this year. It was my first time being there at the same time that you were there. And what I found out about you since that time in our last conversation was that we're both from Jersey. I had no idea. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jersey stand up. I'm out here on Long Island, you know, with uh, basically people who hate me from a sports perspective. <laughs> Giants fans, Jets fans, but it's cool. But, uh, yeah, man, it's a lot of us Jersey people over here in New York doing media stuff, believe it or not. Yeah, I bet. So we got together at CES. We were doing show floor tours. And how many years have you been doing that? Um, With Lori for about... Eight, nine years uh, in total, probably about 17. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm on year three. You had 17. Being my third year doing these tours and having the access that was provided, getting there early to observe innovation. The thing I noticed in year two was that there weren't a lot of brothers there. There weren't a lot of black folks. There's much more diversity in the keynotes and some of the panel discussions. But on that showroom floor, very few and far between. And so for my third year, I just created access for three other guys who had never been to CES, who had this thirst for knowledge and innovation, the same as I do. One of them happens to be a producer that I work with quite regularly on content. So he was able to return the favor for me and shoot video. Definitely want to talk to you about that and see what your opinion of that has been over the last 15 plus years going to CES and in the space in general. How do we quantify where we are and where do we need to go? Yeah, I I mean, I think it needs to be more of us there overall in the light of day. So it's not that we're not there, but, you know, normally, and I I think we had talked about this really quick because some of the powers that be 
who run CES wanted to do a minority implementation initiative. And they wanted to say, well, we want to find out which founders are black and we want to find out which execs are black. And I said, you got to be careful about that because <laughs> if it's not a safe space, we might not want to let you know. Right. <laughs> so that would be kind of number one. I think just in general, most of the black tech and money folks who go to CES before they started to have big marketing events or big car events there, which a lot of people don't realize CES is now the largest car show hmm. in this side of the globe. Um, now it's bigger than the regular car shows. So you have a lot more folks who are in automotive who are here, which has kind of made it more diverse. Uh, but you also have all the marketers here for the last four or five years with C-Space, which also makes it more diverse. So I think that's why you see more professionals there. But the folks who have been coming here, normally we meet up somewhere like in a bar or right. a venue like off the strip somewhere. And I said, I know we need new people in here when I was related to three of the people in the room and none of us <laughs> lived in the same state. I was like, yeah, we, we need new blood. <laughs> My cousins are in here. Like I got a nephew in here. And I think that that's what made me happy about this year because I saw a lot more people who were younger, whether they were in positions of power or not in some of these new categories that were actually at the venue, but then also in the founders. So some of the VR founders were actually black women. Nice. I was insanely happy about that because the people that taught me tech, and it sounds kind of weird, the folks that taught me football and tech were my mom and my aunt. That's fantastic. <laughs> What's funny about that is because of our stations, in this last year at CES, you and I were separated. We were in two different halls, meaning you saw a lot of stuff that I didn't see. So you were, I believe, down in the Venetian. Is that correct? Yeah. So I tried to focus on the innovation and the startup tracks because mm -hmm. that seems to be where we just have no representation. Right. Mainly because of the way it's built now. It used to be if you're really smart and you have a great idea, petition to get a spot downstairs, pay your fee and you can pitch your product. Now it's run by central government. So like the government of France actually owns half the floor where they have mm. all the startups. Um, and then there are other country breakouts for all of that. The smallest one actually is the one from the US. Um, How does that work? And then, <laughs> I'm, look, man, uh, I think during the tours we did, we literally said it looks like a TurboTax booth. <laughs> That's my fault. The other dudes had like these giant LED screens, VR experiences, everything else. So in general, it, it's run by either what country you're from, what private equity firm you're in, and even the shows that they had around pitch competitions were run by two corporations. One was really big, which was P&G. The other was midsize, which was Canon. And the other was actually the US government. So it's like, how do you get into those things if you're not already part of these groups, the answer is you don't. Because right. the only other space they give is for universities, which is basically here, come here to recruit your kids that you don't have to pay a lot of money to who'll build this stuff for you. And then it might be four or five places, maybe about a total of 40 booths that you can use as individuals. And if you're not already in the fold, you probably don't get those either. So it's just not a lot of places unless you're part of that construct of a country with startups that they're bringing to the show, um, private equity firm or private firm that's bringing people to the show, or a college or university or a brand accelerator is the other one. So Samsung and other folks had their brand accelerators down there, but that makes it really hard to make it inclusive right. because you almost have to be in to just get an opportunity to pitch to be on the floor. Hmm. What do you see in terms of just general diversity? Do you see any age diversity? I think it's a lot of age diversity. And I think part of that is driven by the need for people to think that older folks don't understand tech. So one of my former clients was actually one of the bigger boots at CES this year. It was actually ARP. Oh, wow. ARP not only had the biggest booth upstairs, they also brought 500 other companies with them and they've been getting progressively bigger. They have their own brand accelerator. They have their own age tech accelerator. They actually partnered with a lot of the smart home companies and different folks like that to actually build technologies specifically for their constituents. Mm -hmm. So I think there's starting to be a reverse of that because especially with assistive technology, all of that is basically targeted towards people who are over the age of 50. Right. So I think it's starting to change, but I think it's because most of the sweet spot for tech was always 
entertainment, uh, gaming, different things like that. Now it's just way more boring. It's literally like, can you help me with my prescription? Can you help me with my mobility needs? Yeah. Can you help me with medical needs that have actually moved down to pharmacy? So they have ultrasound devices you could buy at CVS. Hmm. Those wow. things are just more important for people over 50 than people under 50. And I think you're just starting to see that turn if things start continuing to go more towards health and wellness the same way as they had, I'll just call it a young people group specific machine like a Peloton or community. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. going to start to see the opposite of that pop up too, where you have people who are older who still want to be well and still want to be around people, connecting with people. So kudos to ARP for their stand up. But I think you're going to start to see that amongst many more companies as things like voice become important um, and even VR. Right. Interesting that you say VR. I'd like to go deeper into that for a second, but just to touch on your mobility and accessibility piece. So last year, there was nothing but robots. I mean, like the robots was overwhelming. It was robots for everything. It was robots for the restaurant, robots for the snow plow, robots for everything. This year, it seemed like the percentage went down of the number of companies who were just doing non-warehousing robots. But the one that actually impressed me this year was a robot that was meant for elderly folks. It had slip and fall detection. You could decide like, hey, somebody has fallen. And I guess it was sturdy enough uh, and had all the soft edges on it that it could assist that person getting back up on their feet. And then it could make emergency calls. So kind of being sick of robots the year before versus this year, like seeing one robot that I thought, okay, somebody gets it. That was pretty cool. What are the things in VR that you're kind of leaning towards? I think it's more mixed reality, right? Like, because I think VR is great, except for the fact that you need really expensive equipment and you need to put something on your face. <laughs> and I right. think literally just to put something on your face thing until you get that right, where it's way cooler than it is now, people just aren't going to want to do it. And, um, you know, I'm not saying anybody, because I realize, you know, me, you, and any of the folks who were in our crew, we're all outliers. We all would do that. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, would somebody in their mid-30s just decide to do this twice a week? And a lot of times the answer is just no, right? Hmm. Like it's not enough content. It's not enough people in their circle that they interact with every week to just do this all the time. Right. And I think the only way you break out of that is, one, you widen the aperture, like how many more people can get access to this thing. Two, you kind of make it make sense with real real stuff. So it sounds stupid, but like virtual try-on is like one of the things that probably makes way more sense than anything else into getting people adopting this type of tech. Right. Experiential is another. So like you're going to see more things with experiential that involve older audiences doing simpler things like trade shows. Cause I think people forget during the pandemic, they had an all virtual CES. It was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, cause I was, I was at the host desk that year. So <laughs> might take offense. No, but I, I meant like the VR part of it. Like you, yeah. were, you were the live video part of it. The VR right. part of it was really bad. I bet. And it's yeah. not because people didn't try, but it's just not enough content or of enough interest for people to really interact that way just yet, unless you're in a game. So if I'm in Fortnite right. and I'm trying to do something with DJ Marshmallow, of course I'm going to do it. Or if Travis Scott is running around, yeah, I'm going to go do that. But mm -hmm. that's a select group of people. I think they're going to start to do more normal things, more mixed reality things, more things that involve retail because people actually want to be out of the house now. And I think you saw that. Like, so, so a lot of the stuff on, on our end were around smart shells, mixed reality, XR experiences or AR experiences where you could buy things off the shelf. Right. Or, or virtually try things on. Makeup would be part of that too. So yep. another slant on smart mirrors that they were using. So I just think you're going to see a lot more things like that before you see like full dive VR type stuff. Um, and yeah, I think that was my, I don't want to say objection, but the note that I had when you said VR, because... I think VR is just too far. I think AR is the deal. It's like, don't block me off from the rest of the world, but just put digital facets into my everyday reality. Meaning, can I still see the ground in, or the table in front of me and see the digital elements? So I'd like to really get into what Meta is doing with their new AR glasses. 
Or are they VR glasses? Mm-hmm. Are they totally blackout? You can do total blackout and all that stuff, but like it's just how many people are. Because the other thing you have, and I'd say CS has always been good for this. They will launch platforms where the content is nowhere near the actual ability for people to kind of call it on demand. Yeah. So it's like AK TV is like, oh man, I got an AK TV. I can watch one show and it came with the TV. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, right. I mean, I feel like that's where that is. Like, even if you have all that stuff, you're only going to be able to do one thing because yeah. they haven't even made the rest of the stuff yet. But that's okay if you're going to, like, for people like me, I've been going there 17 years. I'm like, I'm used to it at this point. But I will say this, the curve in which that content or the viability of any of the products you see, especially on the innovation side, to get to market has shrunk dramatically, right? Like, so In terms of time of horizon? Players, well, yeah. So they, even the way they've run the floor. So it used to be people who weren't ready for even showing to investors, they're downstairs. So they're the newest, hottest, weirdest stuff. And then when you go upstairs, they're the people who are ready for financing and mm-hmm. you can start building prototypes and all this other stuff. Now it's, if it's on the top floor, you could buy it right now. Right. That's completely different. And then the bottom floor, you can still buy it right now, but you might not be able to buy it at a major retailer. So is there really space for the unfunded startup at CES in the innovation space? Or is everybody there already funded, ready to go? It depends, right? Like, is there going to be a space for true startups? That's probably the question that CES needs to answer because, you know, they make a lot of money off of five or six or 10 countries deciding they want to come there with like, 50 startups yeah like i don't think they're gonna give that money away just to make like 200 dudes happy <laughs> I think they need to decide whether there's going to be a place for those folks at ces or they're just going to do something different i think they're now at that tipping point because it's literally gotten to the point where the entire build out of eureka park for the most part is like privatized or built mm-hmm. out by a foreign government so like at that point you're like your individual entrepreneur or an inventor, how do you get into that ecosystem? Or like, where do they place you that's not in the back next to the cafeteria? And I'm saying that because that's literally where they were. Right. Down right. the back steps near the cat. Like, how do you get to the front or the middle of the floor again? Right. <laughs> and I think that's by not being in the same space. But, uh, you know, somebody at CES probably has to make that decision. Mm-hmm. But they're going to have to just decide, do they want to have a separate thing or are they okay with this kind of evolving into this, you know, almost everyone who's past series A or is close to series A type of setup, because that's kind of what it's evolved into right now. Right. Stepping back for one second about the AR and VR glasses and the idea that there's not a lot of content or the 8K TV. One of the things that was on my want to do list when I was in Vegas was to make it over to the MSG sphere. This 8K, what I call the Death Star, uh, being constructed in in Vegas. But it's 8K spherical content. I would love to just walk in under construction and see, what are you guys doing? Where is it? And then I found out after I made it back home that you actually walked through it. Yeah, no, it was great. It it was- Please talk about that, yeah. It was was awesome. Um, You know, it's almost like concentric circles. They have like, the interior sphere, which is like where the performances are, the exterior, you know, they're going to have different things kind of happening with the roof and the exterior as well. They literally have sound setups where you can be in different places inside the sphere and hear completely different content. So that's helpful for language. So you can literally have like five different languages going at one time for the same performance. So Um, the same same visuals, but separate audio. Same visuals, separate audio. Um, And technically, I think the way it's set up based on section, you could be sitting right next to the other person who's hearing something completely different from you. Headphones, Um, not headphones? How's that? No headphones. It's not the silent disco. It's something different. No, it's not the silent disco. Something different. Um, I think they're basically using a mix of audio and laser. Okay. To almost pinpoint directly where the sound's going to be because technically there will be no visible speakers because of the way the screens are going to work. It's just going to be all a giant visual screen. I think Seiko is doing the screens. At least on the inside, they were done with the roof, Mm -hmm. like interior roof, so you could look straight up and kind of see all the screens set up. 
And then I think they also have uh, the VIP suite area where you have like haptic seating and all this other cool stuff. Um, and I believe the first performance there is supposed to be U2 or something like that. Bono. Okay. So uh, help me. As I imagined it, I'm in basically like a planetarium, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the ceiling is IMAX times IMAX. But what does a live performance look like in a space like that? Is it in the center of the sphere? There's a stage and then we're seeing the stage yeah. and, and over it? Yeah. So it's a stage in the center of the sphere. Mm-hmm. Even the stage is surrounded by screens. Okay. And then the artists are going to have content that go along with their music that actually runs on the screens. So every artist that performs in there, you're going to have to have your musical content and you're going to have to have your visual content that actually goes into the sphere that can kind of be used to interact with the audience and different things like that. Um, I honestly think that's why they picked somebody like you two. They were like, well, all right, they're going to be able to pull this off. My question as a business dude was like, what are you going to do the other 200 dates of the year? They're not there. Like, <laughs> right, right. Is, is there going to be some Disney on ice, like, sphere experience <laughs> or something? like? Because I'm sitting there going, not everybody can do that. What you would have to do to have content that would really hit in that type of immersive environment, you have to be good at creating content, too. So I, I'm, I think it's going to be interesting to see which artists are, like, the first five or ten up for that thing. Yeah. Because I, I have ideas. Like, for me personally, I'm like, I want to see what the gorillas would do with that. Because I think it would be crazy. Because they they got a ton of animated content anyway. They don't have to physically be there. They already have a ton of animated content. It's already kind of immersive. They would either create new stuff or use the stuff they have to kind of put somebody into that type of environment. Right. Um, I actually think anything involving like anime or animation that actually has hot music to it. Like I was literally in my brain going, Swiss Beats could do stuff in here because he did stuff for Voltron. So mm. he could do it like, and I was thinking, what would those artists do with like this type of environment? And I said, it, but it's really, will they book them so they can do this type of stuff in that environment? There's a couple other artists. I was thinking Katy Perry and um, Bruno Mars, Taylor Swift, they could probably rock stuff out in there too. Right. But it, it'll be interesting to see who they get, but I think they made a good first choice. Like. Sounds like, number one, you got to have the budget to be able to fill the seats and create the content. And also sounds like some company somewhere who is making 8K spherical content is about to get a whole bunch of phone calls. Or the company didn't exist until the need based on these screens showed up. So it'll be interesting to see oh, who, yeah. they, who's there. Look, even if it's just retrofitting content that's already out there, mm. yeah. Somebody, whoever those vendors are, are probably going to make a lot of money. And they probably need to relocate to Vegas so they can yeah. Exactly. Were you impressed with the space? Yeah. Um, it, it's actually more roomy than I thought. Mm-hmm. And even though it's a sphere, they put in a lot of different things like hallways. Like we were like, wow, it's a circle, but we're running through a hallway like you would in a regular building. A straight hallway? Um, so we, yeah, straight hallway. Right? Okay. They got food court. It's a square, mm-hmm. like inside a circle. But I think that's because they want people to normalize being in there. And if everything was like fit to the uh, perimeter of the circle, people would probably be weirded out. Yeah. So I thought it was a good job of being able to handle that and still having enough room. I think the food court they have is something like five, 6,000 square feet. Um, They have some other kind of activity stuff behind where the main seats are. But just the inside of it was well done without making it look like a you know, weird experience. It it actually doesn't even really look like a stadium once you get outside of the seated area, which I thought was a a good architectural touch because I'm like, normally you get into a stadium, it just looks like a giant circle with a hallway, which is why we thought it was funny because, you know, I'm in New York, I'm going to go to Madison Square Garden. It looks like a big round hallway. Right. So I was going to ask you, you're a New Yorker. Do we trust the Dolan organization to do right here? You know what, dude? I, not for nothing. Me and the other New Yorker in the room, like, man, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. James doesn't have a good track record, right? Right. Um, guys who invited us were from New York, so we were still looking at them like, I don't know, man. But I think on this one, they, they have enough pent up demand. They should be able to do well with this. Right. Kind of regardless. I think Vegas is the right place for it. Like, if they mm-hmm. put this in New York or LA, I don't know if it would do as well. 
but yeah, I think MSG, if they can not dole in themselves, they're gonna <laughs> Is Charles Oakley still banned? I don't know. We're gonna find <laughs> I, I mean, you know what I mean? Like how you gonna ban Oak, man? I, I still... <laughs> right. Okay. So Back to VR for one second. Exactly what you were saying, I saw. There was a company called Lottie, which is a Korean company. They actually had two separate areas in East Hall. And one of their sections was basically like amphitheater style seating. So curved benches and probably 10 stations on each level of VR headsets with the hand grips for shopping. And people couldn't get enough of it. I mean, there was a line down the hall just to put the headsets on. I'm still post covid like, eh, I don't know if I'm putting on that thing. <laughs> but to your point earlier about the headsets being so expensive, and this is even back to the bigger topic of access, it's important to figure out how to get innovative tech, especially hardware, into the hands of end users. Because I think a lot of times we don't even know what it's going to be until people use it and tell us how it's actually going to be used. There's the intent in innovation in the creation space. And then there's, okay, no, people have taken this and made it through something that we weren't even thinking of. I saw companies who were outside of the VR space, but kind of going that mixed reality space by doing basically Buddy Holly looking glasses, the big black frame glasses with the... Yep. Uh, with Wi-Fi capability, and you can actually see the screen inside the lens. We saw the prototypes, but really, you, you want to put like a thousand people in them to see what they're going to be and what they say about it. Did it, you see anything it, like exactly. that on your side? Yeah, I mean, look, I think what I saw is more around experience, right? So one of the cooler things I saw in the innovative space was like around food tech. Mm -hmm. Actually, really food tech and I guess more water stuff. So like... Kohler had some insanely beautiful shower experience where you could make your butt warm and your head cold, like in the same shower. <laughs> and then they had like a cure thing that you could use to have aromatherapy in your shower. And I was like, honestly, I think that was the dopest tech there because I could take it home and use it. Right. Like right now. Right now. And it was like three years from now, it would still be as dope and innovative as it is right now. Yeah. So. Uh, food tech, uh, they had a couple of uh, toaster ovens. They look like toaster ovens, but they actually cooked with light. You could cook like different foods based on the type of light you shine on it. Basically push button recipes. You control with Bluetooth. Um, I thought that was dope because I said, if you don't have time or you can't cook, this is for you. Like you probably have electricity wherever you are. So like you can plug this thing in and cook. They even had right. different vegan things that were built out that I thought were pretty interesting. So they had two different takes on vegan milk. Okay. Actually, vegan and I guess the other one was technically vegetarian. One actually used um, microorganisms mm -hmm. to provide the casein to make ice cream. Okay. Instead of animal fat. Right. The vegan option was actually using macadamia nuts instead of almond to make milk. Okay. And that one was interesting because macadamia nuts cost less to grow than almonds. Like California will tell you almonds are eating all the water and that's why I mm. nobody can water. But it was an interesting take because it wasn't things that I expected to see out of food tech. And then the other one, I basically gave folks free business advice. It was a company, um, Evercase, I think it was. Okay. They figured out a way to agitate the atoms in frozen food so it doesn't freeze, but it still stays cold but the water molecules can't lock up to create ice. Interesting. And they So no created, more freezer burn. Yeah, but it keeps food for up to 26 weeks longer, right? And they're oh. trying to sell it to me for my refrigerator. I was like, screw my refrigerator. You need to talk to Kroger or Albertsons or whatever. Right. I mean, there's like a billion dollar or anywhere where you're trying to get food to people who don't have food. Right. Like this would change their lives, right? Like I was like, why are you worried about me and two steaks in my refrigerator? <laughs> this is so much bigger than that. I literally was like, I called somebody at National Retail Foundation, like, please put these people in your show. I know it's next week, but you need to put them in there. And I right. think it's because these guys came straight out of the education sector. I think it's mm. University of Hawaii and came out to the show. And I was like, this is the best thing I've seen at the show. Like from Interesting. impact standpoint. Like right. If you have a food desert, this could kill a food desert by yeah. itself just by packaging. Because right. it was just packaging, by the way. The tech was in the packaging. And the packaging was really small. But I'm like, yeah, you need something the size of the refrigerator you're showing me. 
And then we can start talking because then, you know, people who make food for a living or ship food for a living, they would pay you billions with a B of money to like do this. That's fantastic. Because at first I thought you were saying it was chemical and I'm weary of chemical stuff. So on the food tech side, there's the dark side of things. I caught wind of, did you see 3D meat printing? Yeah, I mean, look, we are not there to 3D meat print anything. (laughs) I'll use the experience I had in dealing with my guys in the military. You only eat an MRA if you have to. Right. Like if you're in the International Space Station and they got to 3D print your food, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. You're not going to your kitchen going, you know what? I'm a 3D printer steak. Like, because it's (laughs) just not like we're, I'm not saying the technology isn't good, but it should be used where appropriate. I don't think anybody's putting that in their house to just. Right. Yeah. It's great for the bottom of the ocean or on Mars or the moon. Um, And I do understand the concept of food deserts. And I understand that, you know, uh, every place on earth is not as abundant with resources as say, you know, where I am in Cary, North Carolina, but bruh, if you have access to a 3d printer, <laughs> I think there's, yeah. I think there's a yeah, disparity see, between what your resources are. If, if you've got enough electricity for a 3d <laughs> printer and you got enough money to buy a 3d printer for food, which probably costs more than the regular ones, right? just go get some food, bro. Get you, <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Give that money to the farmers or whatever you got to do. Figure out water tech. Exactly. That's crazy. If you can afford all that stuff, you probably could just go get some food. (laughs) Right. I mean, I get it because as like a sci-fi guy, I love the idea of iterating towards the food replicator we see on Star Trek. They're taking molecules and the computer's rearranging molecules to make whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Just don't ever bring the iterative steps to the marketplace. Don't ever have somebody eating 3D printed hot dogs. I just want to see the hot dog show up. And then, like, I don't, <laughs> and then, and then, like, then, then you might eat it. But like, yeah, yeah, I think that we don't need to see the steps in the middle. You're totally right. We just right. need to see the end product. Like, keep that with, with <laughs> the military, you know, uh, space or maybe oil rigs, stuff like that. Mm hmm. Right. Under exploration, hey, this is what you guys got to deal with. But like, whose kid is going to eat that? Yeah. It's really more of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, if you have some kid under 10, good luck with that. Whose kids should be eating it even better? Because you might get a kid to be like, oh, that's cool. I just printed a star shaped hot dog. But with all we know about nutrition and food, the more processing, the worse for us anyway. We need to yeah, find ways t- to like, figure out what we can do with innovation and food tech to deal with minimizing food waste, which is really where it's at. Yeah, I think housing, if you were going to talk about 3D printing, housing and I would probably say medical and healthcare with the printing of things, including organs, are the two areas where I think 3D printing could just change the world. Agreed. A friend of mine actually sold the first 3D printed house on Long Island. And, you know, I said that could be insanely powerful for a builder that's being asked to produce affordable housing because right. now you don't have an excuse to do it. I mean, and they basically did the same kind of Long Island split level household with like three bedroom, two bathroom type of setup. And mm-hmm. it looked like a regular house, but they created it in, shoot, a fifth at the time. Awesome. And so I guess they used some kind of AutoCAD software. Was it concrete printed? Yeah. Okay. I've seen those. That's that's pretty cool. Concrete houses, first of all, are fantastic. Number one, mm-hmm. before you got the 3D printing with hard forms, but now you add in the idea that you could print one. I'm sure it happens in a fraction of the time. I don't know about cost though, but pretty cool. That's, oh, cost, that's good stuff. like house was sold for under $350,000, which on Long Island is pretty dang good for a 3D right. It didn't cost a ton. They could change the mixture. Mm-hmm. So you can have harder concrete for different pieces and lighter concrete for others. Right. So there's that whole idea of you can mix things with the concrete to actually make different forms. So right. walls, you can have your exterior wall be a different density than your interior wall. Mm. Um, soundproof, all those other things just by building and form. So it is a pretty unique process, but I think those are the areas where 3D printing is probably going to be um, I'll just say more impactful. The other part that they have this year is you could print out your face onto your own action figure. 
Yes, I did take part in that. And yes, I got some for my kids. I I'm did. so I, mad that you didn't call me next year, wherever you are, I need to be because you get all the cool stuff on that side. Yeah, man. I think Mattel had some stuff over there. I just waited until everybody kind of dropped out of the line, waited until they went over to one of those golf demos. And I was like, I mean, I got two boys. So I sit there going, I, I got to do like 3D printed action figures. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job as a dad. That's so, fantastic. <laughs> Had to pick all those up. <laughs> That's fantastic. Big picture question. What are some of the problems or the big questions we should be looking to answer via tech and innovation? So one, we talked about food tech and food waste. That's probably one of my personal problems that we can solve if we're not focused just on capitalist expansion, but also using innovation to solve some of today's problems. Are there any particular problems that you put a pin in and identify and watch? Um, yeah, I always watch anything around mobility. Mm -hmm. um, because I think just access to things is part of the superpower that tech should have for basically all segments of people. So I think it starts to get at eliminating those things like the food deserts, um, the ability to get better education, you know, better health, like all of those societal ills, right? I think the other is specifically around any sort of communication or representation. Um, tech has always been good at showing us things we want to see and not necessarily things we need to see. Um, anything that allows us to get people to see more things that they probably need to see or are unaware of, um, I've always tried to keep track of. Um, and then I think the third thing that I've always looked at is how does it shrink the curve on the ability for you to even see what's possible with the use of tech in just everyday occurrences, right? Like, so things like the automated toothbrush, which were hard for people to attain and didn't gain a lot of adoption, but then help people do things like floss because nobody really wanted the floss. But when you right. got a toothbrush to do it for you, then everybody did it because mm -hmm. now it's cheap enough that everybody can do it. I think that's another superpower that people underestimate with tech, like with things like smart fridges or even smart TVs being so affordable now, People get to find out, oh, well, what's in the fridge? When does it go bad? Should I renew? Right. Should I get something? What calories does it have in it? And how does that affect my meal? Like the machines do that now for you. So it will yeah. help you now in being aware of what you're eating, which is super important for folks who are in disadvantaged groups or areas. I think looking at what type of tech just makes that a smaller gap uh, has always been super interesting to me. And I think that it's become more of a thing at CES, I would probably say the bad part of that is you also have things like sustainable ad tech, which I will save for another time, but I think it is the most useless thing ever. We're going to save the earth by having an ad call be slower. I'm like, I mean, of the things we could be fixing right now, y'all, that's got to be somewhere way down in the hundreds or thousands of things and numbers, and y'all pushed it all the way to the top because... I, I don't know. I guess somebody can monetize it. It sells, right. Exactly. Because it leads to more revenue. So the question that I think we need to solve is something that was illustrated by the pandemic, which was unequal access to the internet. When the world sat down, we should have all been able to get at least the same level of remote education. And mm -hmm. we saw the, the gaps in that. We saw that there are towns in any state where kids would have to go and families would have to take their car out to go park in front of some store or building because the kid had to do their homework. And in their town, they didn't have high speed available because it's rural or whatever. And I think that that's something that we can solve. And it's something I'm definitely tracking, you know, just the idea that tech can solve a ton of problems with probably less effort than we think. You know what I mean? No, completely agree, right? Like, for whatever reason, I got involved in working with the political organizations in 2020 and 2021. And one of the biggest issues we had um, around that and even the U.S. Census, which my team had a chance to work on, was how do you send email to somebody or an electronic um, application for things like the census when you don't have access to the Internet and your version of a smartphone is track phone's best version of, right. you know, the worst phone you yeah. could possibly get. And the sad part is it's a lot of places in this country that I guess folks weren't aware of until they had water problems or, you know, there was a natural disaster that 
the natural disaster didn't make it look like that. It looked like that for a while. It's just now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it looked like that yesterday. Right. And, you know, most of the places in Mississippi that people are worried about right now or Louisiana or some of these other places. So the whole idea behind having infrastructure so you can do these things affects people with the internet. It affects people with cell service. It affects people with electric cars. One of the things that people don't understand about anywhere else in the country that's not a city center, try to drive an electric car, any electric car, from Cincinnati, Ohio to New Orleans. You won't get there in less than 20 something odd hours. And that's across because, multiple Because of the days. charging? Yeah, because none of the, they don't have superchargers on that route. Mm. Right? Like, so I know that. that's, that's the story for a lot of places in America. And I think about where I live, I want to say it's like eight superchargers near my house. Right. And I live on a damn island. Yeah. So I know yep. that's not normal, right? right? Like it's enough rich people with a Tesla. They're like, hey, it's <laughs> it's like a fake Tesla service dealership near my house. Right. That's the second one they built. And I'm like, that can't be normal everywhere. So what do you do <laughs> if you have an electric car or, or a Tesla or something like that? And you're in like Louisville, Kentucky. You, you trade it in. Yeah, you trade in for an F-150 because <laughs> you know it's going to take you about 300 miles and then you need more gas. But I, I think that it's starting to hit almost every device, right, that you have for all those things. It even hits things like mobile payment. Try doing mobile payment in the hood. You can't do that. Mm. I'll use my Apple Pay. They don't say that in any hood in America. <laughs> <laughs> just not happening. The bodega is not taking the Apple Pay. Right? Uh, right, right. So, I, I mean, I think it applies to a lot of devices where either the local governments need to subsidize all those places being able to have the same type of infrastructure as everywhere else, or the um, utilities themselves, and that includes the Verizon's and T-Mobiles of the world. They just need to get more involved in making their connection better in some of these areas because it didn't just hit people who were disadvantaged. It also hit people who just didn't live near a city center. I remember right. the entire pandemic, I couldn't use the internet from 10 to 5. Wow. I had to be somewhere else. Like if I tried to do this right now, it probably would have stopped about 40 minutes ago. That's crazy. Why, yeah, just because it's the switch wasn't big enough to accommodate the number of users? Well, it wasn't enough to accommodate the number of users at the same time. So think mm. about it. You have small municipalities that are under 50,000 people that are normally outside of city centers, which means your connections are put together however they could get them there. Right. Probably got one hub for four different towns and their mm -hmm. kids, the parents and everybody are all on at the same time, somewhere between 10 o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. And that hub was only meant for probably about 10 percent of that yield right. times everybody. So yeah. it was a problem everywhere. It was exacerbated because most of the folks who didn't have fiber optic and places like that it was rural and it was a disadvantage or uh, a poorer area. It was sort of like the power grid where it's like, man, when we gonna fix this, are we gonna wait till all the lights go out in Texas for Texas to fix the power grid? To me, those are industry-wide problem that a lot of the tech companies could help address, but I feel like they're gonna need one more really bad emergency and then they might actually go fix it. But the pandemic laid it wide open. Like mm. the internet is not made for 280 million Americans all be on the internet at the same time. Like it, the internet was like, oh, hell no. Nah. Some of right. y'all can't be in here. And, you know, I don't think they even thought about it until it happened. Well, necessity is the mother of all innovation, right? Yeah, that's true. So we'll see what happens. Take the tech space as you know it. How would you, if you could wave your magic wand and improve it, improve the space in terms of access, the voices in it, what I tried to do on a very small personal level, just bringing three guys in whose voices would never have been heard, the reason that that was important to me is the same reason it should be important to Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark or anybody. It's the fact that if you don't have diversity at the table, then when a darker complected person puts their hand underneath the faucet in the bathroom, the water doesn't come on. Right? You need voices, test set, you need all that. How do we fix it? What is the next step? What are the changes we should be making that create equitable, and to take your phrase, safe space in the voices in tech and innovation? I think calling into the light of day that most marketers and most tech companies actually use diverse groups to test most of these in the first place. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so somebody at ran an innovation lab, we always had a diverse group of people who were testing what we were doing. When, you know, we tested Verizon's Fios when nobody knew what fiber optic systems were. We found a small rural town in Texas and we tested it there. Guess who was there? Black people and Mexicans. Like we didn't go around and go, it's just for the white people. Like, right, 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 it, right. But then when they launched it, it was just for the white people, right? Like it was only, <laughs> so I feel like if we just kept that same freaking mindset for all this stuff we keep testing, whether it's social media, tech, anything else, it'll probably just be better. Somewhere in between going to market and somebody going, you know, this is the largest market opportunity. I don't want to make it sound as bad as it is, but it's what happens. It gets whitewashed. Like we yeah. get left out. Like, even when they did streaming music and they launched things like Spotify, they're like, oh, well, we don't want to start with hip hop. And I'm like, well, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. You actually mm-hmm. launched a company in Southeast Asia. So now why is it not inclusive when it gets to America? Right. Right. So I think the mindset seems to switch when it rolls into go to market mode, when it's mm-hmm. being tested, when they're looking at the idea of what to launch, what not to launch. It seems like the mindset is there when it's still in beta. Mm -hmm. It's when you go to market somehow, it just, we become less of a priority. And I think that's the part that I'd like to see change, primarily in tech, because I think that's when you get to start to get the snowball rolling on. We launched a product that's inclusive. The people who work there are inclusive. We're Mm -hmm. recruiting people who are inclusive. Our vendors are inclusive, right? Like it doesn't become this unnatural thing where it's like, all right, I have to explain to a whole bunch of white dudes that because they're black theory on why we don't want to tell them that we are when we're registering for their system they would have that built in already, right? Like, hey, we're trying to figure this out for our company so that multi-ethnic creators will get their credit for such and such. Like they would word it in a way that's not awkward and ridiculous because in a lot of cases, even in asking people, what are your diverse either genders, um, race or ethnicities or identification for things like the census, it's the reason we only have five because we're scared to ask the any of the other questions <laughs> because we haven't got anybody who knows how to address it. So if they were already there, we'd be able to say that like, Hey, are you Jamaican Chinese? Instead of going, you have to be Asian. And they would go, right. I'm Jamaican. Right. Right. And I feel like we need more people in the room when they're bringing this to the masses and then it will probably look right. When the folks who come on the stage and bring things to market are always basically a white male between uh, 18 to 45 or 18 to 54, that's going to continue to be the people who kind of gravitate around these types of things. And um, I think just having more representation when you bring it to the world helps you lay the groundwork for just being more inclusive as you build out the product instead of we're going to test it on all these diverse people and then we're throwing all that to the wind and we're launching for white people who live in the suburbs or white people <laughs> who get in a cab. Like uh, people were like, oh, Uber helps black people get a cab. I was like, no, it doesn't. We pay more money and it doesn't go to our hood. Mm. It didn't even understand that. I was like, you realize the Uber guy can go, I'm not going there. Yep. It, it has happened. happened. It happens to you. It has happened to me. Exactly. Where are you going? It, or you get the phone call. <laughs> After you've already put in my destination and my sudden location, you get a phone call. Where are you going? What, why are you calling me? Yeah, <laughs> it's in the app. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Come pick me up. So <laughs> Find cool. out when we get there. You, you sure you're going there? Uh, yeah. That's, that's my house. Right. <laughs> that's hilarious. Listen, my goal in not even just this conversation, my goal this year I want to do more of what I was able to carve out just in here in my infancy, in my third year at CES. The message is we belong here, all right? I can share news about innovation, tech, food, not for black folks, but from a point of view that I'm uniquely of my culture. I think that is something that we should see more of in the CES Live or any other convention live. When you see live people broadcasting, I'd like to see a more diverse panel of broadcasters sharing their perspective on what they saw, what they know is coming up. I'd like to be one of those voices. That's why I like what you're doing, because one of the things I would say has been notably missing in the entire time I've been at CES, there's never been a stand-up from a Black media news or entertainment source at CES. 
even while people are becoming billionaires who happen to be black. So when Ray J right. took over the center floor with Raycon, mm -hmm. there was no black media coverage of that. that. There was actually no minority news coverage of that at all. Mm. Right. As he became the biggest name in electric bikes and um, wireless earbuds outside. Earbuds. Of yeah. Yeah. Like he, he became the dude. Nobody covered it. So, I mean, I think part of that is we have a lot of folks who are actually in this type of ecosystem. There's not enough coverage bubbling these folks to the top. I told somebody else, I was like, this was normal to me because it was normal to my family. Like they all worked at Verizon or Bell Labs or AT&T or somebody went to NCA and T or what it like, you know, they went to Tuskegee and I'm yeah. like, I know I'm not the only one, but I did notice that it never gets covered at right. CES or anywhere else. Like even if we are there, it never gets covered. But then you have something come out like hidden figures and people go, oh, a long time ago, it's great that that happened. I'm like, no, like that's still happening right now. Y'all just yeah. don't talk to these people. And I feel like, you know, where you're saying you have a personal mission to bring more people to that. Mine has always been uncover those people. Cause I'm like, they're already there. Just no right. one's talking about them. So I think bringing light to the people that are already in the space so they can attract other people who want to be introduced to it um, is also part of that. And I thank you, brother, for what you're doing with your media platform. I think there need to be more people who have media platforms who, instead of trying to extract value from these things, are trying to add value to these things. And there's yep. just not enough of that yet. Yep. So we got a mission, <laughs> right? We got some work to do. And like you say, I think that if we're wildly successful, we add value to every single vertical in which we participate. If it was Sundance, if it was Can, if it was CES, whatever it is, having new voices at the table that can speak from culture about the data, it just expands the audience and broadens the perspectives at the table. So I want in, I'm, I'm already in, I'm pushing harder and I want your help. That's the deal. That's the message to everybody. That's it. Good. I think that everybody out here who can just cause more buzz around the fact that there are people in this space, we're trying to bring more people into it and that we do have needs for us to bring up around content uh, that's outside of entertainment based content, but also development of devices, the ability for us to kind of show up and show out in these spaces. I think there just needs to be the continued push for that from people like us. So just really asking everybody to join the fight. 100%. That is exactly it. Melvin Wilson, thank you so much, sir. It has been fantastic. And I expect that we're going to continue this conversation on a very frequent and regular basis together. Most definitely.